Hey everyone, I think one of the confusing things for everyone is just trying to get straight like the SN1 versus SN2 versus E1 versus E2. So I just wanted to make a quick video working through some of the problems and then maybe that'll help clarify how to think about these. Um, the first thing I do generally is I, I read from left to right and mainly I look at these two things and then we can talk about solvent and temperature as well. So the first thing is I might just look at this molecule and determine what the leaving group is and it, the carbon it's attached to. Is it a methyl group? Is it primary, meaning attached to one carbon, two carbons, or three carbons? This carbon is attached to one, two, three. So therefore it's a tertiary carbon. And with tertiary carbons, I know tertiary and secondary can make good carbocations, good enough that they can form. So I'm going to write a little note here. I know that if it was primary or secondary, that it's probably it could be substitution. And when I can do carbocations, I, I can do E1 or SN1 with the carbocation intermediate. If I have a primary or secondary, probably going to do more of an SN2 kind of nucleophile attacks leaving group leaves kind of thing because there's not a lot of steric hindrance. Obviously primary is going to be better. And then if I see all three options like or if I have primary or secondary or tertiary um, then the E2 can happen for all of those things. So for tertiary I can do E2 or I can do a carbocation and do E1 or SN1. So those are what's possible. I'm not going to get SN2 because uh, this is not going to come in and attack and make that leave because there's too much steric hindrance. All right, next thing is I'm going to look at this and that's going to help me narrow it down between those two things. This is tert butoxide. If you draw it out, this is what it looks like. You can tell it's a pretty bulky base and nucleophile, so it's not really a good nucleophile to come in. Tert butoxide is a poor nucleophile, so that's going to rule out substitution. So I'm not going to get SN1. So what's left is E1 and E2 for tertiary, okay, so for this example. And um, now I'm going to look at it as a base. As a base, it's got this O negative, so that tells me it's a strong base. And then if you guys remember, strong base goes for E2, and weak base is E1. So that's because a weak base will sit there and let this dissociate first, and we make the carbocation that kicks off E1. Strong base will not wait for this to dissociate. It's going to come in and grab the beta hydrogen and kick this out while making the alkene all at the same time. So strong base favors E2. Therefore, I'm going to think about the mechanism here. I've got beta hydrogens here, here, and here. Those are all beta hydrogens. And I'm going to go ahead and just grab one of them. And remember, this is anti-periplanar. That's something that you might want to go back and review. Uh, but these are the products that I'm going to get. And I'm going to focus mainly on my carbon. And this happened by E2 mechanism. See, so I could figure that out without even looking at the solvent. Now the solvent is an aprotic solvent. Technically E2 is favored by protic solvent. We haven't talked about that. So I wouldn't focus on that um, for E2. But we did talk about the role of protic solvent versus aprotic solvent for SN1 and E1 and SN2. So we'll look at that in a minute. Now with this example, again, let's start over here. I'm going to see that this, this is my leaving group eventually. Not a good leaving group yet because OH- is a strong base. We want a weak base. It needs to be stable when it comes off, remember? So this is a 1, 2, 3. This one's tertiary as well. So we have the same kind of options available to us as before, E1, SN1, or E2. Now we look at this. This is not really a base at all or a nucleophile. This is a strong acid. And so whenever we have acid, then we're not going to get E2 because that needs a strong base. And we're not going to do substitution because this is not really a nucleophile. This does not get want to attack. So what happens instead is an acid-base reaction occurs first. And we turn that poor leaving group into a good leaving group. That's going to make this one a dissociate because I have no strong base 
to kick that off, I'm going to go ahead and dissociate it first. That's going to make a carbocation. So hopefully you see that with acid, we tend to, to uh, make this into a good leaving group. So you'll see that when you have alcohols, is we'll use acid to make it a good leaving group. We'll go into one of our carbocation mechanisms, either E1 or SN1. So again, we're not doing E2 because we don't have a strong base. We have an acid and a weak base. And sometimes it's concentrated acid, so we really have very little water to come in and attack. If we did attack here with water, we'd just go back to here. Instead, what we'll do is we'll note this heat symbol. This delta means heat, and heat favors elimination. And that has to do with entropy. We're going to favor um, creating more um, disorder um, by having the water come off and then making an alkene here. So we're going to uh, look for beta hydrogens, and there's several. Remember, beta hydrogens are next door to the leaving group, in our case, next door to the carbocation. Now, can you figure out which beta hydrogens we're likely to lose, red, green, or pink? You could lose all of them, but we're going to have a mixture. If we lose the pink hydrogen, we're going to end up with this alkene. If we lose a green hydrogen, we're going to end up with this alkene. And if we lose the red hydrogens, we're going to end up with two possible stereoisomers. You could get the methyl groups cis to each other, or you could get the methyl groups trans to each other. So have E and Z isomers here. Now we know that E1 actually favors Zaitsev. I'm not going to favor this one. And then from here, I'm going to look at which of these is the most stable alkene. So here's my alkene. And the stability of alkenes is based on how many R groups are attached around that alkene. So in this case, I have tri-substituted alkenes versus a tetra-substituted alkene. Therefore, this will be my major product, E1. And then if you had to state minor products, you could say these would be your minor products. All right, so again, if you see a strong base that usually favors E2, if it's a good nucleophile, it also favors SN2. If we have an acid, probably you're starting with an alcohol. We'll do an E1 reaction. All right, so now let's take a look at the next one. First, figure out what this is. With secondary, everything's possible. See, secondary, secondary, secondary. So then I look at the nucleophile and try to narrow it down. This is a good nucleophile. And it's also a strong base. And how do I know that? Is I'm using a chart that we had before from Klein, actually, right here. This is really good to have. So here's hydroxide is a good nucleophile and a strong base. But what you really should focus on is the oxygen is negatively charged. The concept is that it is um, electron density being high means it's a good nucleophile and a strong base. So in other words, I would redraw the hydroxide like this. That's really what's reacting with this molecule. Once you have that, I know a good base, or sorry, good nucleophile favors SN2, a strong base favors E2, and so unless I have any other information, then I would put both of these answers. But it does give me the temperature. Remember before we said heat favors elimination, so the opposite of heat, if you did this at cooler temperatures, like room temperature, 25 degrees or below, I would favor substitution. So I'm going to pick SN2. OH is going to come in, an opposite side attack, and I'm going to get this. And that's because it says cold, so I'm going to not put the elimination product. If I had not specified the temperature, I would have also had this elimination product, E2. And if this was chiral, it's not chiral because I have two methyl groups here, but if one was ethyl and one was methyl and I could make this wedge, then I would make sure that I have this dash. Or I would just make sure that, you know, it's the opposite stereochemistry. R turns into S or S turns into R. So on this one, I see I have secondary, which can be any of those pathways, E1, E2, SN1, SN2. 
So I look at this, and notice this is actually the nucleophile and the solvent, or it is the base. Okay, there's only one chemical here because alcohols and water are liquid. They're often their own solvent. So what is this as a nucleophile? Well, I'm using concepts instead of a chart. This is neutral, so it's not really strong. Uh, it's probably weak. So because it's neutral, um, I know that it's going to be a weak nucleophile and a weak base. Based on the weak nucleophile, it's SN1. Based on weak base, it's E1. So it's going to be a mixture of SN1 and E1. And if you recall, the first step of those mechanisms are common in that there's a carbocation. And then you always, whenever you make a carbocation, you want to watch out for a rearrangement. Okay, you just have to ask yourself, is this likely to rearrange? What do you guys think? This is secondary. Is there a way for it to gain stability by rearrangement to a neighboring carbon? I would say yes. This is tertiary here. If I could move that positive charge here, I'm going to shift a hydrogen over there, and that's going to allow me to form a tertiary carbocation. From here, I'll go ahead and do my SN1 and E1. So what that means is I'm going to do the SN1 by attacking that from either side. Again, this is achiral because I have two methyl groups, so it doesn't really matter in this case, but if I had three different groups here, then I would have both dash and wedge versions of this, meaning I have both enantiomers. And then the elimination of this creates either the Hoffman double bond or a Zaitsev double bond. E1 usually goes by Zaitsev. Okay, at least that's what we're going to do in this class. So we're going to have both the SN1 product and the E1 product as a mixture. Now in terms of solvent, um, we did talk about that a little bit. So if I'm going to do, let's say like I'm going to do an SN2 reaction, um, a aprotic solvent helps to keep the nucleophile free to attack. So aprotic solvent is going to be great for SN2. Um, and uh, But I would say that the solvent doesn't determine so much um, for the examples we're going to use in this class. You're pretty much going to know what the answer is before you even get to the solvent. Like this is secondary, everything's possible. This is a good nucleophile. So SN2 is possible. Um, and it's also a strong base, so E2 is possible. Uh, so, and then in this case with aprotic solvent, that's going to help keep the nucleophile free. And so we're going to really favor SN2. Uh, we didn't talk about what E2 prefers. It actually prefers protic solvent. Um, but for our purposes, uh, we're just going to go ahead and write both products are possible. Um, Klein actually likes to make a distinction between these two products. He'll say secondary actually provides a lot more steric hindrance. It's more like tertiary. So Klein actually likes to say E2 is preferred in this, in this reaction. But I'll go ahead and write that both are possible. Um, and again, here, if I had shown the stereochemistry, you would hopefully show the inversion if that was the case. And then for E2, we have a small base, so we're going to favor Zaitsev rather than Hoffman E2. Now, the kind of questions I might ask about solvent are things like, you know, for this SN2 product, is it going to be faster in DMSO or is it going to be faster in water? Water is a protic solvent, and so hopefully you would say it's going to be faster in DMSO because it doesn't shield the nucleus or the nucleophile from attacking. Uh, in a case like SN1 and E1, uh, I would want to do this in a protic solvent to help stabilize the carbocation intermediate. Um, so actually, these reactions prefer protic solvent, which often is the same as the nucleophile anyway. All right, I hope this helps. Maybe try a few more of these that we skipped and then check your answer and then get more practice out of the book if you're having trouble.